Warning, the following opinions are that of my own and not of the larger whole of any fandom. Also, while major adult content will never be shown and or allowed, some adult language may be used at any time. Viewer discretion is advised. I really should have made this announcement a long time ago, but... Hey guys, before we get into the Julie Madalena interview, I wanted to mention another interview I did a long time ago. I very much thank Toku Chris for this opportunity, as I got to do a two-part text interview with Kyle Higgins! Yeah, we had to do a text interview rather than a video one because Kyle was busy at the time, but I was still so happy with how this one turned out. I'll be posting those two parts in the description below. But now, on with the show! Hello everyone, welcome to Zeltrax's Interviews, where I'm trying a different program this time. Lovely. Yeah, for this one we had to, we had to start with Zoom because um, Julie's uh, thing couldn't do Skype. So here I am with Julie Madalena. Say hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. <laughs> but yeah, Julie is, ironically, my first ever interview from someone with from Power Rangers. I would have I would have wanted somebody else, but eh, she asked she, she responded first. Wow, I knew how I rank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're you're fine. I have a, I have a That's couple a of um Power Ranger VAs uh loaded up Good. On, loaded up on interviews. Like I got Good. um David Fielding happening. I got mm -hmm. I got to set the date for that. I have uh, I actually have to contact um Wally Wingert in a, in a month or so to get Aww. him. Fun. Yeah. All right, so let's get started because this thing, this thing that normally lets me do like 45 minutes. So let me just uh, get this sure, sure. done and over with. So first mm -hmm. question we got here is, what made you want to get into acting and subsequently voice acting and later doing ADR work for anime? Wow, great question. Um, I was uh, dancing from a really young age, fell in love with the theater in junior high, um, and did my first movie at 16. And uh, when I did my movie at 16, I was in the Bay Area and um, mm -hmm. Carolyn and JJ Barry were um, teaching a, an, an improv class in the city and my agent made me take it. She said, you should take it. It'd be fun for you to meet them because uh, they were up from LA and they said, um, they promptly threw me in their pro improv group <laughs> and said, when you come to LA, we will hook you up. So, you know, I had no idea that could have been one of those, you know, you know, call us, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stay in touch moments, but it wasn't. They sincerely uh, took me under their wing and helped me get started in the entertainment industry. And I was doing television and commercials and film mm -hmm. and uh, all sorts of fun stuff and studying really hard with them and dancing still and doing all that fun stuff. And um, I actually... Uh, had to stop dancing. I had had a back brace and I have severe Ugh. scoliosis. Um, so I did have to stop dancing, which was my passion. Mm. And when that happened, I was like, you know, okay, when God closes a door, look for a window, right? Yeah. And uh, so I was just kind of uh, considering my options. I loved theater. I loved what I was doing on camera. But I had a friend who said, hey, you know, I'm doing voiceover with this studio in LA. If you want to submit a a headshot and resume back in the day, hundred years ago. And mm -hmm. I did, and they trained me on the job. I fell in love with it. And it really was dubbing. It was, uh, uh, in, that's really how I cut my teeth in, in voiceovers. And, mm -hmm. uh, I am still working with some of those people today, decades later. Um, they're my closest, dearest and oldest meaning how long I've known them, not their <laughs> chronological age friends in the business. So nice. yeah, it just evolved. And that voiceover work, of course, uh, diversified into all different kinds of voiceover work. So yeah. And yep. that kind of, that kind of sort of answers my, the first question that I have here, how'd you get casted in children of the corn? Uh, you know, really the old fashioned way, my agent, uh, uh submitted the audition to me and I went on the audition and, and it, um, kept getting callbacks until it was between me and one other gal. I wish I remembered her name because it would be, she's such a part of my story now. And mm -hmm. I'm sure she's gone on to do other things. Beautiful gal, long brown hair. I just remember how gorgeous she was. And, um, you know, I thought, Mash, she'll probably get it. 
because I was, you know, short with my wacky hair and, <laughs> and um, I was pleasantly surprised to hear that I got it. And that was it. That was just, it was literally that old fashioned, nothing fancy. Very nice. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my, my second one is, is around, around a bit of um, your Wikipedia page doesn't list all of your roles in order. Thank God for behind the voice actors. So <laughs> how was doing the dub for Magic Knight Ray Earth and playing the role of Hikaru Shido? Because uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth actually recently got new model kits. Oh, really? How fun. Yeah, they just started, <gasps> they started getting brand new model kits of the three main heroines. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. Oh, how fun. Yeah, I'll have, actually... to, I'll, have to, I'll have to send you an email regarding the new model road kits for Ray Earth because, sorry, Fl sorry folks, newsflash, if you want to follow Julie on, on Twitter, you can, but I can't guarantee she'll, she'll respond back because she doesn't do Twitter very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. horrible at social media. I love people and I love to communicate and connect with them, but I'm horrible on social media. <laughs> Yep, you're right, Jesse. Yep, <laughs> that's true. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, doing um, Hikaru in Magic Knight Ray Earth is actually uh, really one of my favorite stories because Eric Sherman at Bang Zoom uh, cast me in the role. I don't remember like if I went through a process mm -hmm. of auditioning. I don't remember that part, but um, probably because I had a toddler at home and was tired all the time. But, you know, uh, I I, I was kind of overwhelmed, you know, I had my little one, I think I was pregnant with my second one. And mm -hmm. I thought, I don't know that I have time to do this. So I actually tried to back out. And I remember uh, I was spending time with family and Eric called me and he lovingly yelled at me over the phone and said, you can't back out of this. I, I want you to do this role. Um, he didn't let me say no. I'm really <laughs> glad he didn't because I fell in love with her and fell in love with Eric, fell in love with the whole team, you know, mm -hmm. Pat Rodman at Bang Zoom and Eric. It was the three of us uh, doing that show. And it was, it's really one of my favorite memories as a voice actress. And I'm always grateful to Eric for busting my chops and saying, get mm -hmm. your butt into the studio, you're doing this. And I'm really glad I did. Very nice. So mm -hmm. my third question here is that I have not played the game that the movie is based on, but I hear it's really good. Nino Cooney, that, because you played a character named Dandy in it. So what was it like playing with that character? And I've looked through the VAs attached to the movie and Max Middleman, Alejandro Saab, Billy Sampler, rest in peace, among a, among a, among a lot of other yes. great VAs. Oh, okay. Nino Cooney. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so, it's so fun to work on the show these shows with some of these amazing actors, but we rarely get a chance to see each other in that environment unless mm -hmm. we're, you know, passing from, you know, from session to session, passing each other, somebody coming in, somebody going out. So I do miss that. Um, but I did really enjoy working on it. It was super fun. Um, and yeah, I, I honestly, I think I was surprised by it. The more I got into the, into it, the more I was like, mm -hmm. this is really fun. I'm really enjoying this. And uh, always lovely to be in the company of such wonderful voice actors as all the ones that you listed that were on that show. So, and God rest Felice's soul. She's, yeah, I was she's actually, amazing. I was actually thinking about interviewing her because of, because one of the last things she did was the uh, Digimon Tri movies. Which, oh. which, which was really, which were, which were really good. Yeah, she's a, she's awesome. I got to direct her um, before she passed in a couple shows, and um, she's just a, an ab. She's a quintessential pro, right? Mm -hmm. She's absolutely uh, the last of a dying breed. Just, well, that's probably really poor taste, but yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> she's she's part of the the old school. You know, very very talented. Uh, original crew that I grew up with. Yeah. All right. Question four here is like, there was something I was a bit intrigued with and that was the ghost in the shell touch comas. You would think <laughs> that with a majority of the blue ones, they would all have the same voice, but no, there were a ton of them like Laura Joe Miller voicing a couple, Melissa Fawn, Sandy Fox. How is it like sharing a role like the touch comas with so many voice actresses? Well, you know, we don't own the role. That's for sure. Yeah. And and something like Tachikoma, it just, I mean, it was actually, it's actually kind of fun to share that with other actresses. Um, it's always a joy to do something like that. 
you never know if you're going to get to do it if it comes back if there's another mm -hmm. iteration of it down the line so i think it's fun i'm really thankful i got to do it we had a blast doing it um and yeah i am i have no there's no weirdness around that i think especially in the voiceover <laughs> community we're just really super supportive of each other and always grateful for what work we get and always grateful when our peers are working too so it's yeah. fun it's like the community of the tiny you know little animal or creature voices you know <laughs> yeah so it's another micro family <laughs> but yeah um recently i've had to work on writing my questions better as i've noticed a lot of them in past interviews that they all sort of sounded the same so my apologies if the questions up till now have sounded all the same no worries son yeah as an attempt to have this question sound a bit different than the others what was your experience playing the characters jesse martin and luca the cat in the anime igpx immortal grand prix god tsunami reran that show so much it wasn't even funny <laughs> i loved doing that that was super fun um I loved being able to do a character, a female character in that environment, let alone the cat was a riot. It's always fun to yeah. do something sort of off the, pardon the pun, you know, beaten path really, you know? Yeah. So I, I loved playing those characters. And of course the show is a blast and very energetic, um, but it's always fun to do a female in that kind of context. So I was oh, thankful yeah. to do that. Yeah, really thankful. But yeah. and. Question six is has something where I was confused on something with your BTBA page because it okay. said that you played Agent Mai and Young Krillin on Dragon Ball Super, but Wikipedia says something different. Did you play those characters in the Bang Zoom dub of Dragon Ball Super, or are these wikis playing a stupid on me? No, no, I definitely, well, I directed it. So I was ah. also popping in and out for, they, they would just say, hey, do this part and do this part. So I'd pop in and out and do it. So... Um, I honestly don't remember all the parts I did, but um, what is what did Wikipedia say that was different? Um, uh, Wikipedia said that um, Agent Ma Agent Mai, when she was when she was put into a younger body, and Young Krillin were voiced by different by different actors. I don't have the page okay. up for uh, up for me at the moment. Okay, yeah. Who did they say played those? I'm going to see if it sparks it for me. Do you have in front of you who they said played those characters? Yeah, let me look. Dragon Ball Super, and I'm probably going to edit around shows this. Shows removed from directing that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be cutting around going to be cutting around this. Let's yeah, it see. sounds like that's probably uh, it's true that it was those two were played by other characters, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and that's another that's another thing that kind of bugged me about certain shows, and this is like question six point mm -hmm. five. Why, did, mm -hmm. why do some animes often get completely different dubs from different companies? You know what? I, I can't explain the motivation the company has to do that. Um, I really can't. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense um, unless they get a better package there, you know, and they decide mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they want to go a different direction. I do know that as an actress, I've been a part of a show that's moved from season to season to a different production company and a different recording studio. And it's almost always due to either, um, you know, the quality of the work that they're looking for, the team that they want to work with, or a package deal that they're getting that it works for them at the time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, and sometimes it, you know, there, it, and this is just a guess, like I said, I, mm -hmm. I can't, speak to what their motivation would be but it could be that there's a director that they want to work with and that director's working through a different studio exclusively you know so they're like okay we're taking it over there so i have heard of that so that's just those are just my educated guesses yeah you know, from what i've yeah. seen yeah from what I, from what i can understand here uh let's see apparently colin clinkenbeard did the funimation dub version of agent agent my from battle of gods onward so there's that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I so believe she was in the 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 one with us too. But here here's the challenge for me. I've gone from show to show to show, and that was like a, lo a while ago for me. Show to show to show, directing casts of great numbers of actors, and then being in my own shows of casts of great numbers of actors. So I can't mm -hmm. always remember 
who played everything. So forgive me uh, for not having that at the top of my head. Oh, you're oh, you're fine. But yeah, um, what was your favorite anime that you've done ADR work on, or are they all your favorites? Ooh, um, for ADR work. Mm -hmm. that's a tough one because I have favorites for different reasons. Some mm -hmm. for the, the challenge, the character was some for like Hikaru loved it because, you know, kind of the, I almost always say that's my favorite just because it was such a, a marker in my life uh, as a female, you know, mm -hmm. as an actress to be able to play a, a kid, you know, a young, young woman who was such a, you know what, she's such a badass, you know, she was just such <laughs> yeah. a, she was a warrior. And, and that was, that was something that was new for me. We didn't get a lot of opportunities to play characters like that as women. And, um, you know, it was so exciting to be able to play that, you know, that used to be our joke, you know, like, you know, I could say I can be a, uh, I could be a guy, you know, I could be James Earl Jones. I could be, you know, <laughs> all these things that I couldn't be vocally. So I never got a chance to play some of these different kinds of characters, these tough women that were, you know, warriors. And so that was a blast. And I loved the arc of the character. I loved the, there were some cool moral images, stories, storylines, you know, um, in terms of like a uh, spirituality, you know, I just, mm -hmm. I love that good versus evil, the development of the girls, their friendship working together, you know, there's so many beautiful things in there. And it's kind of, I've had a lot of people say that it's, you know, it's the old school anime, you know, mm -hmm. that was really fleshed out and developed and the storylines were really fleshed out and developed and, and, you know, I don't know all the things that people love about the old school anime, but those yeah. are the things that I loved about it. It was kind of groundbreaking for me personally. And of course, it just, you know, opened up a whole new world for me of main characters in anime and voiceovers in general. So mm -hmm. um, there are tons of characters. Almost every character I play, there's something about it that I love because it's either different, you know, or just like wild. And I, and I, I like getting a chance to do different things. Mm hmm. But yeah, now time to gush because time to talk about a thing that kind of got this ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Ascendance of a Bookworm. One of my oh. all-time favorite animes, despite it being an isekai anime, because I don't really like that trope. But this one did just <laughs> enough to get me loving this show. Are there any sort oh. of like behind-the-scenes stories regarding recording for the show? Although I did kind of chuckle when... Urano slash mine was crushed under books to get to the alternate world because most of the time <laughs> in animes, it's something different Sorry. every time. Though weirdly, mm -hmm. they seem to really enjoy running people over with trucks. <laughs> well, you know, first of all, I, I loved working with my cast and, you know, needless to say, there were a lot of long recording sessions. So I'm mm -hmm. very grateful that I had the fabulous cast that I had. And um, really behind the scenes was just like, oh my gosh, how many lines does our main character have? You know, because <laughs> she, it was very, it was very wordy. But, <laughs> you know, it was also one of those shows that, um, we fell in love with them. We surprised ourselves that we fell in love with it because we didn't know what to expect at the beginning, looking at the sort of premise. We thought, okay, where is this going to go? How can this, you know, how can this develop into something mm -hmm. that is going to be winsome and addicting, you know? And it really did. Um, I was, I loved the historical and the educational aspect of it so yeah. much. Uh, we all did. We were all kind of like, that's how you do that. And I didn't know you could do that. And, you know, we, we felt like we expanded intellectually, you know, and culturally, uh, as well as just being, you know, challenged to develop new characters and create winsome characterizations from both the directing and the acting standpoint. So um, love the worlds, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's coming back. Uh, yeah, know, be yeah. yeah, because um, the dub is starting to enter season two and the anime itself is currently in season three. Yeah. Yep. So we're coming. We're coming there where we were uh, supposed to start up and um, 
we there was a slight delay over the holidays so we're mm -hmm. hoping to start up very soon and uh, looking forward to getting back into that and seeing what's ahead you know what a unique storyline and um yeah. yeah unique topics were addressed you know challenging yeah. topics were addressed in that so yeah um question nine is a bit of a, a bit of a broad one what would be your favorite episode from the shows that you've worked on? You can be broad, you can be broad about it or short, sweet, and to the point. Um, wow. Well, it's hard to answer that. Um, I don't know that I could answer an episode, mm -hmm. so I'll probably have to be broad. Um, of course, as an actress, um, my favorite episodes were when my character got a chance to, you know, develop, grow, you know, have an arc, you know, cause usually when you mm -hmm. go from episode to episode, there'll be a focus on a character or a focus on part of the storyline, right. Or a, mm -hmm. a focus on um, an issue. So uh, my favorite opportunities are the ones where my character gets a chance to go deep and Very nice. uh, go through an arc. Yeah, of sorts. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, here's the here's an here's a question ten here where come here comes the section of the interview that I normally save towards the end or so because I want to acknowledge and mention the other accomplishments of the people that I'm interviewing because I ain't a one trick pony here, people. <laughs> so with that said, Power Rangers, everybody. So your first <laughs> role on Power Rangers was Arachno Fiend in season three of Mighty Morphin. How did you come up with the voice for that monster? Oh my gosh. You're really like scraping the cobwebs of my brain. This is probably that's the same way I, like I do to, it. That's what I like to do with some of the uh some of the what some of the interviews that I've done. I've done that with um Mike Pollock. I, like the first the first time I've ever interviewed somebody, I did Mike Pollock. Mm -hmm. I, I did him mm -hmm. and then um Lee Tokar, I did him. I did him shortly after the um, Mike Pollock interview, and he was just, he was just a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> I love my voice actor peeps. <laughs> <laughs> They're some of the best people in the world. Yeah. Um, okay, so you know, usually what goes into creating a character voice for me mm -hmm. is, and especially in that context, it was seeing the character. Yeah. So it's usually a combination of seeing the character from from my standpoint and then the director saying this is kind of what we want to go for and then just playing with it until we get it just the way we like it. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. usually right out the gate, I can suggest something and say, yeah, how about something like this? And then we'll finesse it and fine tune it till we get it just, just the way we want it. See the director, yeah. you know, the fun part of that is the director takes into consideration, um, the context in which that voice or that character is living. I might not have the, that point of reference as the actor. I mm -hmm. won't know what every other voice sounds like. So, um, especially when I'm working on it with other actors that have a similar vocal placement or age range that I have vocally, you know, we always want to make sure that we're going to distinguish the characterizations from each other. So that's something else we have to take into consideration. Yeah. And swapping over to another Saban show, which was Masked Rider, which was adapted from Kamen Rider Black RX, where you played the little floating robot fact of Count Dragon's forces, which blurted out Masked Rider tidbits so often she was an early version of Wikipedia. Would you say that fact would be the precursor to another role you would get later on in Power Rangers as a uh, Decca from in space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Once you uh, do a character like that and that placement is familiar, comfortable for you and people have heard you do it, um, they're more likely to consider you or know that you can do that, you know, when something else comes up down the line that is similar mm -hmm. to that. So yeah, definitely. Um, it expanded me vocally and I was like, oh, that's a voice I can do. And that's one of the ways we grow as voice actors too, is just from trying stuff and going, oh, I didn't know that voice was in me. Um, I've had experiences like that on the job where um, directors will be, can you do this? Uh, yeah. Can you do this? Uh, I think so. Can you do this? Well, let's try, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's the fun of the playful fun uh, aspect of VO that I love. Yeah. And speaking of Decca, how incredible was it to work on presumably the last season of the franchise, but 
that was saved by In Space being so dang good to the point you were surprised the role in Lost Galaxy. Kind mm. of a shame that the Mega Ship didn't do much in Lost Galaxy, but it made sense since the darn thing didn't have the Nasada shuttle needed to form the Astro Megazord. And I did shed tears a bit when the Mega when the Mega Ship blew up in uh, Lost Galaxy's finale. Not to mention mm-hmm. the fact that by the end of said finale, there was a considerable body count when like seventy five percent of Terra Vendra blew up. <laughs> I'm going to try to remember your question, which was at the beginning of all that very fancy, detailed, well informed information. Yeah. Uh, okay, I remember. I'm playing with you. Okay, <laughs> it it was you know it was such a wonderful era being a part of that show because it was so it was so different and fun and you know. And it was a very social time for us. Um, Scott Pachter, Scott Page was directing a lot and he just recently passed. So yeah. we're May still, the community peace. still mourning. Yeah, his loss and um, shout out to Sydney, sending love and hugs to her, his wife. Mm-hmm. Um, but the world and the environment that was created there, uh, you know, I'd bring my kids with me and Scott's, office was filled with toys and so they would just sit in there and play with power ranger at all toys right and yeah. of course they were always because the shows were shot you know at this shot at the sound stage and our recording was done at the sound stage uh there were always these full you know size whatever you know uh costumes props and it was just a very fun environment to come in and work and almost always and Scott contributed to this mood, you know, uh, almost always people would be just hanging out and spending time together and chatting and goofing off in the hallways while we were waiting for our turn to go in and record. And um, yeah, it was a really magical kind of a, a you know, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm glad we were able to be a part of that and uh, really yeah. kind of knit us together as a community. So I'm super grateful. Yeah, I've, I've, watched the franchise ever since i was three years old i'm i'm a literal 90s kid and <laughs> i've i've been blessed being, being able to meet so many ranger actors at morphicon and stuff like that i mean just uh, recently i just um i just got a commission from sabrina lou who played scorpina on the episode gold Arts vice versa i'm making a few bits for uh-huh. her scorpina costume because she's actually going to be going back to morphicon in a couple of months oh cool that's wonderful yeah, and I've and I've re- and I've done a lot of things recently with uh I've done miniatures like Ooh. this on my resin 3D printer. Wow. And speaking of the um Power Ranger toys, because I have this on my on my uh desk right now, the uh-huh. newest one six scale action figure of the Green Ranger. Wow, that's amazing. Cost about a hundred bucks. Wow. Yeah, I'm happy I own it because I wanted to try the uh, one six scale figures at least once. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. But yeah, really, last, really. Excellent yeah, work. one of my other one of my other questions here regarding Power Rangers is that, of course, Power mm-hmm. Rangers has changed hands a lot. It originally, it yeah. was originally owned by Heim Saban all the way up until Wild Force. Then the show was bought by Disney for better or for worse, especially when they felt embarrassed to even own the show around the time of Mystic Force, <laughs> to Saban buying the show back for the Neo Saban era, starting with Samurai, again, for better or for worse, until after Super Ninja Steel. The rights for P- Power Rangers <laughs> and really everything under Saban Lock, Sock, and Barrel was bought and currently is held by Hasbro. With all that said, Julie, if asked to, if asked or if you wanted to, would you consider returning to the Power Rangers franchise in any capacity? It can be a monster or a voice role like Decca doesn't doesn't have to matter. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, of course, of course, it would be a blast to be able to do that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. In any capacity, it would be a blast. Yep. Yeah, recently, yeah, recently with the new season Power Rangers Dino Fury in the episode Old Foes, they actually brought back Lord Zed. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah, they brought they brought him back with a brand new costume, which allowed him to actually fight worth a darn. And he tossed a lot of people around like rag dolls. Oh, fun! Oh, what a great character to bring back! Perfect. Yeah, currently right now, um, Andrew Andrew Lang, the dude who voiced um, Evox in Beast Morphers and Vengex in Power Rangers RPM, is currently doing the voice for uh, Zed because Robert Axelrod passed away a couple of years ago, which. Rest in peace. Yeah. Oh, yes. Aww. 
But yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that episode when it when it uh, aired. But yeah, it's glad to, it's glad to hear that you if you were asked to, you could return to the franchise if asked. Sure, 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 sure. Of course, it would be a kick in the pants, a <laughs> blast. <laughs> But yeah, I guess with all that said, I think we're at the end of the show. So what can we expect from you, Julie Madalena Kluwer, in the future? Hey, I said it, I said the name right. Ta-da! <laughs> Very nice. Well, I am continuing to work on uh, as an actress on the Nickelodeon series Deer Squad. So that's fun. Mm-hmm. So we'll keep our eyes peeled and new seasons coming out with that. And continuing to direct, I've got returning <laughs> seasons for Rising of the Shield Hero and Ascendance of the Book. I Flipper. still need to watch that one. Yeah. Oh, please do. Let me know what you think. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So still continuing to direct and keep your eyes peeled of uh, video games, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, continuing to just work in every capacity. Staying creative and staying involved. Yeah, I also I do I do appreciate you talk taking the time to chat with me, Julie, especially with us getting us getting Zoom to work because I've never tried never tried using Zoom before. Oh, I'm thank you for being flexible. Uh, my computer does not like Skype. Skype does not mm. like my computer. My new setup, Skype can't handle it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So I apologize, but thanks for being You're, flexible. You are you are fine. I've been I've mm-hmm. been I have been flexible for a decent amount of my life. I've had to be flexible with the last few months of me doing interviews because of certain things in my life. I'm not going to get into it here because yeah. But yeah, with all that said, our contacts can be found in the description below. I will try to link Julie's down below. But again, she does not do social media very well. She's admitted this herself. <laughs> but yeah, I try occasionally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, yeah, for what that's worth. Yeah. So in closing, this has been Jesse, a.k.a. Zeltrix Millennium with Julie Madalena. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>